Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and I am really excited to bring you this episode. It's with Jason Hassa, who is a master sommelier. We talk Texas wine. We talk Texas wine pairing with barbecue. You're going to love it. It's so interesting. It's interesting to hear his path and how he got into wine. And we talk specifically about, and I think you guys will find it really interesting, about how you become a sommelier, how you become a master sommelier. That process is extremely interesting. And we talk about how he got into barbecue. That connection started with the best barbecue show with Terry Black's Barbecue. He currently works for RNDC, which is a wine and liquor distributor. He has focused on the 15 Texas wines that they carry and spreading the word throughout Texas. We try two of the different wines, get into that. If you're just listening to this on the podcast, I'd check out the YouTube version because it's cool to see the wines and see our expressions and see and see him and how he's explaining things. And so that way, if you see him on the barbecue trail, tell him hello. And also, he does mention in this at the end that if you want to reach out to him on any of his social media platforms, he'll get right back to you because he is a wealth of knowledge. It's super interesting. I really think you're going to love this. Thank you, Jason, for taking the time. And I'm super excited to have two partners on board for the Kevin's Barbecue Podcast and YouTube show. They are AJ's Custom Cookers out of Saginaw, Texas, as well as Tree Oak Stilling out of Dripping Springs, Texas. AJ's Custom Cookers has been around for 11 years. AJ Ramirez, who owns AJ's Custom Cookers, has been has been welding for 27 years. He specializes in TIG Healy artwork, fancy metal, stainless, copper, aluminum, brass, but he can pretty much do anything. His specialty is custom. Custom, custom. If you go to his website at ajscustomcookers.com, I'll put that in the show notes. You can see all the cool stuff he's done. It's not just your run-of-the-mill smokers, which is great. He can do every type of smoker, every type of pit, but he specializes in very, very unique designs, and he also specializes in fixing cookers that are not quite up to par for somebody. If there's a mistake or if there's something that's not working right, give him a call, shoot him a message on social media. He's at AJS Custom Cookers. You can find him on all the social media. Shoot him a message. He'll give you a quote. Great guy. Loves loves the chat. Loves the barbecue world. He's done stuff at Smokeaholics, Zavala's Barbecue, Panther City. Lead time's about 12 months right now. I currently have a pit on order with him, so I'm a customer as well. And he knows that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of options out there. So there's a lot of guys making pits, but he's a special guy. He has something special. He brings his own passion to the job, and I think it shows. Again, check out his website at ajscustomcookers.com. Shoot him a message, see what he can do for you. And Treaty Oak Distilling out of Dripping Springs, brand new on board. I'm on board with the bourbons, the whiskey. And if you're digging these, please subscribe. I have a YouTube show. If you're just listening to this on podcast, it's youtube.com slash Kevin's BBQ Joints. I add about two or three interviews per week, as well as tours of butcher shops, barbecue joints, steakhouses, prime bread places. Lots of cool stuff on the YouTube side. Um, all the social media at Kevin's BBQ Joints. I have a website at kevinsbbqjoints.com. Lots of cool content. It's going to be a lot better in the next week or two. Blowing up. Going to have a brand new website. Been listening to what a lot of people want. I think it's going to be something you're going to love. But once again, thanks so much for listening, for watching. Enjoy. Uh, good morning, Jason. How are you? Good morning. How are you today? I'm great. I'm glad we finally got this together. I've been meaning to talk to you, and I've also, I'm have also a huge fan of wine and pairing wine with barbecue and meat, and I think uh, this is like a, this is a meant to be. This is meant to happen for a long time. I'm very excited to talk to you and talk about you know wine and barbecue, two, two of my three favorite topics to talk about. What's your third favorite topic? Coffee would be the third, I guess. Oh, cool. Well, then maybe we could do a coffee episode sometime. I d- coffee is... That's a great pairing. Exactly. Well, especially too, like with, with like Millers and there's a lot of people that are doing like, and coffee, it, it just, it makes complete sense. I bet for, for a lot of people, maybe not. And that's another reason why I want to talk to you because perhaps wine doesn't always come to the top of someone's list as a great pairing. I agree. No, there's, I think it's now becoming into, into its own as an acceptable pairing with barbecue where you know i think a lot of people still kind of go to that gravitate toward big red and beer and Mm -hmm. you know it's at the end of the day it's food and wine so why not try all these different things to 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 enjoy it with your with your barbecue and you're a big champion of that and that's kind of that's the road we'll get we'll eventually get to how you got there but where did you where did you grow up so i grew up uh, born and raised in chicago uh, I went to high school in Denver, Las Vegas for college. Okay. Um, so I kind of got a little bit of a wine bug, even more so there. But 
growing up, my father was an attorney in Chicago, and he had a wine shop as a side business, so we always had great wine around the house. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so, yeah, so that's kind of how I started to get the wine bug at an early age, you know, try a little bit at Christmas, and then, you know, as I got older, share a, share a bottle with them, and then when I went to college in Las Vegas, it was kind of like, you know, go on a date, and you're 19 or 20, wasn't exactly legal yet, but uh-huh. I'm going to try to get a bottle here. Um, and then I started working for a French chef at the Eiffel Tower restaurant uh, in La- in Paris, Las Vegas. So then, did you go to UNLV? I did, yes. So yeah. with the hospitality was it the hospitality. Exactly. My degree is in hotel management, but wow. uh, I found the the passion for food and wine. And uh, there was a flyer where uh, at, at school it said "interested in wine, wine runner position available at Eiffel Tower." And I'm like, I'll apply. You know, I was working at Bellagio at the time. And I was like, okay, let's go check this out. And basically all I did at Eiffel Tower Restaurant was stand by a ticket machine. And the wine orders would come in. I'd run to the cellar, bring them to the sommeliers. And I did that for an eight-hour shift. And But it gave me time to like sit at that machine and read wine books and kind of really kind of learn more about it. Can you talk a little bit about the wine the wine situation in Las Vegas? Because it's massive. Like there's a lot of wine. Yeah, and I was there... So I went. I was in Vegas from 1998 till 2003. Okay. So a, a while ago, but and that was just evolving as being one of those destination places for Michelin star chefs and all these new guys were coming to Las Vegas and and I haven't been back since 2011 and I know from just in that eight years it's even kind of more so grown into that destination for food and wine and mm-hmm. shows where back in the day when I was just getting to college it was still all about gambling and you know kind of more you know adult oriented mm-hmm. but now it's like it's completely one of those food and wine destinations had wolfgang had wolfgang opened yeah spago was there um chef joho of eiffel tower and uh, who i worked for was there um julian serrano of picasso was there oh, just yeah, picasso. there with, yeah with picasso so it was you know well, yeah and wolfgang had uh del monaco's is there uh, at the venetian okay so and i think that kind of spurred on to more people gravitating towards opening restaurants there. Yeah, at a, at a time, I know that it was even like people. I used to I used to work in the hospitality business. I used to furnish hotels, and so I I had done the Paris. We did we, but not like the whole entire thing. But we did you know furniture like suites or whatever. But we but I at that time gambling was such a big portion of the revenue, and even yeah. slots. I know that I think that it wasn't Paris. It was one of the Caesar's properties. They did a million dollars a day just in slots alone, and mm-hmm. and that and now I think it, I heard it's like forty percent of the of the revenue is from food and wine. Yeah, and I mean it's food and wine, and like obviously the the amenities at the, the spas and everything true, else true. that kind of encompasses what it is now a resort destination. So did you think then at that did you get the bug at that time? Like your dad had the had, was it a wine shop or just a wine business? It was a, it was a liquor store in downtown okay. Chicago. Okay. So, but he always had French Bordeaux. That was his thing. He loved Bordeaux. Wow. So, you know, we had you know in high school, you know, if I wasn't driving, going out with my friends, you know, we'd watch a Friday night movie together, order pizza, open up a bottle of wine, he'd <laughs> tell me a little bit about it, and so that kind of was really the starting. Point Great education. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, and. At, at, and Eiffel Tower is kind of like, you know, it was a French restaurant, so it was predominantly French wines plus a little bit of California. Um, and so that's kind of where I really started to, to get into it. And then I got to a point where uh, I was done with Vegas. I was kind of like, okay, I've been here for five years. That's I'm a good. lot. <laughs> and all my family is still back in Chicago, so uh, Chef Joho owned restaurants in downtown Chicago as well. Oh. So I asked hey, do you ever want me to go to, to Chicago? So I ran one of his restaurants in Chicago, downtown for a few years, which was, again, wow, great amazing opportunity. experience. I lived downtown. My dad was downtown. We got to go to the oldest Italian steakhouse called Gene and Giorgetti's every day for lunch together. So, oh, that's so great. Yeah. I mean, I was 23 years old, you know, just getting into everything. That's so the it was life. Great, <laughs> yeah, it was a great learning experience. And then I realized I knew French wine. I didn't know much about California wine. So there's an opportunity for me to move to Santa Barbara. Okay. And I was their manager at a restaurant and then eventually one of their wine people at the Bacara Resort and Spa. Yes, and which is an amazing property. Yeah, in a- it is a property. So I spent two years there, again, learning California wine, learning just the hospitality industry as a whole. But for me being a city kid, Vegas, Chicago, you know, out Denver, I was like, Santa Barbara was cool, 
but it was a little sleepy for a 25 year old kid. Were you living in Goleta or were you? I lived in Goleta, yes. Okay. I lived in Goleta, drove up to Bacar every day. And then, you know, I always like to make the joke in Santa Barbara, you're either a college student or you have $150 million <laughs> and you hate Oprah. That was neither. So it, it is sleepy. I lived in Ventura for okay. about a year and a half. And it was, yeah, it's, it's, after a while, you've gone to every restaurant. You've done almost everything. It's beautiful and wonderful, but I think it's a re- place to retire more so, in my mind. You know, and as 25, you know, going, living in Chicago and Vegas, like, after after work, you go out and you go find a bar or, you know, a beer or someplace. And Kalita is like, okay, there's maybe one place to go, and they shut down at 9 or 10. Yeah. And you're like, okay. It's, it was, so I was ready to go. And then, so I found an opportunity to be uh, one of the wine stewards at Pappas Brothers Steakhouse in Dallas. Okay. Um, I applied, sent a cover letter. I had just passed my introductory course with the quartermaster sommelier, so I was still very green as far as my knowledge. Um, but that's what they were looking for. So I moved to Dallas in uh, February of 2007 okay. and spent uh, seven and a half years of my career as one of their sommeliers at uh, the grand award-winning Pappas Brothers Steakhouse in Dallas. And there are three uh, steakhouses now. There's two in Houston, one in Dallas. And it was... It was the most valuable education as far as wine that I have gotten, you know, I think to this point. Do they have other rest type of restaurants? Is that, yeah. am I thinking the right thing? Okay. Yeah. The Pappas family. So yeah. Papa Do, Papacitos, Papas Barbecue, um, Yaya Mary's is one of them. Do they have um, like so a they, New Orleans style? Like a yeah, Papa, that, oh, that yeah. one. Okay. okay, Papa, okay. Yeah, that's Papa Do. So that's, that's their Cajun yes, okay, restaurants. Okay. Yep. And the Papacitos is their Tex-Mex. Okay. They have the steakhouses. They have... Papa's Delta Blues now, which is kind of more Southern comfort, fried chicken and barbecue. Okay. Um, they have Papa's Barbecue, so that it's 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 a very large uh, privately held restaurant company. So, but again, amazing education. Yeah, that's great. And so I spent, like I said, about seven and a half years. Uh, that's where I passed my certified exam with the quartermaster sommeliers, and then I passed my advanced sommelier exam uh, while still working there. Can you explain that a little bit? Because that's like I think it even more difficult, not more difficult than the bar, but it's it's up there with challenges. It yeah, it's a very it's a challenging uh, criteria. It's, so there's four levels uh, within the quartermaster sommeliers America. So the first uh, level in exam is an introductory course, which is basically a two day survey course of basically a crash course of wine from all over the world. Like okay. you have to go in there knowing something about wine to understand what's going on. So it's a two day survey course, and at the end of the second day. There's a 75 question multiple choice exam, mm-hmm. um, and then once you pass that, you are eligible to go on to the certified exam. Um, and technically, w- until you pass that certified exam, you can't call yourself a sommelier because you haven't done any service gotcha. uh, for the court. So once you go on to the service, or excuse me, the certified exam, it's a one day exam. It is a blind tasting of two wines, one white, one red, written. It's a written theory exam, and then there is a service, a mock service exam, where you basically you're put into a restaurant environment and a you're scenario asking, kind of yeah scenario exactly. And so once you pass that, then you have to go on to the advanced course, which is a couple day survey course again, kind of assessing your knowledge of you know kind of getting you ready for the exam. Okay. And then once you've gone through that, then you may sit for the advanced exam. And that is a uh, examination of a written theory exam it's from wine questions all all over the world, you know, wine laws, yeah. grape varieties, etc. Uh, a blind tasting of six white or six wines, three white, three red. Uh, you have to de- based, identify the grape, the region. Or is it? I don't, yeah, so I, 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 don't, within, I don't know. I'm just assuming. <laughs> yeah. So within 20, 25 minutes, you should be able to base, based off sight, smell, and palate. Identify the grape varietal, the country of origin, the region of origin, the quality level, and the vintage wow. based off sight, smell, and palate. Okay. So three white, three red. And then there is, a, again, a service scenario where you're asked to perform, again, decanting, champagne service, food and wine pairing, business-related questions just to show your proficiency as a beverage professional. You need that knowledge. That's important. Yes. It's a, it's a ton. And then uh, once you pass that, then you're eligible to sit for the master's exam. Now, I've sat for it a couple of times, and it's a very, very difficult exam. Uh, it changes from a written theory exam to a verbal uh, theory exam. So basically within an hour, you're asked, again, questions from all over the world about wine, spirits, 
um, beer, sake, just to show your proficiency as far as knowledge. Wow. And then the same, same blind tasting, same service scenario, but you have to pass at a higher percentage. Okay. So I think now worldwide, there's only about 250, maybe a little more um, master sommeliers in the world. So you have, so you've made it through the three levels, but it's that I've level. done three of the four. I have sat for the fourth three times. I just haven't, haven't crossed that hurdle is something I would still like to finish. Uh, I'm still actively studying theory because you have to do the theory exam first. Um, so once you pass that exam, then you can go on to the service and the tasting. When you do, when you do the one where you're, you're trying six different wines, three white and three red, when you, uh-huh. was it an aha when you had the first sip, like, or the first, when you were like, how was, how dead on did you feel? Cause I always wonder like, cause you're nervous and you want to, you, you want to perform of course. well. Oh, nerves, yeah. nerves play a huge role in it too, because you're sitting in front of, you know, your mentors and your, and your, you know, people you look up to. And I think it was for me, because I failed the advanced exam the first time I took it. Uh I actually missed it on tasting. Okay. And then six months later, I went back. You know, again, it was just, it's, I think to me, for me, and again, everybody's different. It's just tasting those wines over and over. And then hopefully that morning or that afternoon when you take the exam, you know, you put your nose in that glass and you go, oh, I know what that is. And you have to, you know, give the descriptors. You have to kind of check those boxes as you're going. And it's basically, I've heard people say it's CSI of wine. What is it not to get to what it is? Oh, okay. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So basically if, if, if you're looking at a, a red wine and it's super dark and inky and, you know, you can't see through it, it coats the glass, you can probably throw out you know, that it's Pinot Noir or it's Gamay or Tempranillo, you know, it depends. For sure. But again, it was, when I, when I passed, when I finally passed the advanced, it was, I knew what I called. I felt very confident on what I called. And then I walked out and I saw my buddy who had just taken his and he was an exceptional taster or is an exceptional taster. And I said, what did you call? And he told me what he called and I go, okay, I think I got it. Oh, so wow, again, that's it's so like, great. No, it's, just, it's, it's interesting, know, the mindset and how that works. Cause, we, cause that's, a, that's a world that a lot of people don't get to step into that world. Yeah. And you, and you, you do not know, they don't tell you what the wines were after you either did not pass or you did pass. Oh, wow. You never they get don't to even, tell, oh, no. They don't even do that. Oh, that's crazy. So, so are they trying, are they trying to, are they, do, they they've got to put some curveballs in there, right? Isn't that the, that's gotta be the goal. Right? They are. No, it's, it's, it basically, the most classic examples of that particular wine out there because they, I mean, they want you to pass at the end of the day, they truly want you to pass. And so they're not going to give you some esoteric South African thing that you've never heard or tasted of, because again, that's not the idea. The idea is to show your proficiency at tasting classic wines from classic regions and classic vintages and, and showing how you are able to identify those. Not that one grape that you'll never taste again in the rest of your life, that, that you just happen to find in a small village. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I guarantee you, like, they're not going to give you a Texas Aglionico, which we have in our glass right now, because, again, maybe one day it'll be considered as a mm-hmm. classic example of a classic grape from a classic region, but as of today, they wouldn't be giving you that. I digress, because we're getting to that road. But I, I think that, and I hope that people find this interesting, because this is a world that a lot of people don't get a chance to walk into those, those shoes. And it's, it's interesting, and there might be someone who's listening who wants to go down that path, but it, and it seems to be very daunting. It seems ex- extremely You know, there, there's, there's, quite, there's, about, there's three governing bodies for wine education. There's the Court of Master Sommeliers, there's the Wine and Spirits Education Trust, and then there's the Society of Wine Educators. So again, like while I was very service oriented because I was working the floor of a restaurant, maybe a journalist or a wine writer kind of does more theory portion of it, which the other two are geared for that. But again, if you're studying for one, you're studying for them all. I mean, you should be able to, you know, so, use aspects of each. And even even if you you took a, a career path that changed, having that knowledge that you have now is invaluable. I think for the rest of your life. Oh, well, look at me. I mean, I went from working the floor of a restaurant my entire career to now being in the distribution business, sure. you know, so while I still think it plays an important role because I can still walk into restaurants with sommeliers, restaurant tours, and I still know, you know, the lingo that they're going to be because I was in that role. So yeah. I think, you know, kind of plays hand in hand, you know, you know you're, you're cut from the same cloth. And while my business side of it has changed some, you know, because, again, I got married, had a family and then. You know, working till one a.m. at a restaurant is not necessarily conducive to <laughs> not at all. little children. 
But, you know, at the same time, I still can go do speaking engagements, dinners. And again, you know, wine always changes. It changes every minute, every year, vintage to vintage. There's a new producer. There's a new region. So it's not like True. you you pass and then that's it. There's always something new to learn. Yeah, exactly. Like, so how did you So how did you go from the restaurant to what you're doing right now? Like, did you jump right to, is it RDNC? Is that? Okay. Uh, R- RNDC. RNDC, so. excuse me. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, so I uh, I did a brief uh, stint with RNDC um, in what they call their combo division, which basically I sold wine and spirits. And basically, I was a, a sales rep, okay. um, kind of going from restaurant to restaurant, bars, and and just you know pitching different things that worked for those places. Uh, and then I had an opportunity to follow a, a friend of mine up to Kansas. Um, so he was working for a guy named Leslie Rudd, who is the founder of Dina DeLuca oh. Standard Beverage in Kansas. He owns Rudd Vineyards. He has since passed away, but okay. is, he founded Rudd Vineyards, um, Oakville Grocery in Napa. Oh, okay. Oh, so, wow. That's a, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So my friend Drew was working for him uh, in their fine wine division, and the opportunity for me to come up with uh, my wife and our first son. And uh, so I spent four years in Kansas um, oh. learning how to sell wine in Kansas, which is a completely different animal than selling wine in California, Chicago, <laughs> Texas, because, again, it's a smaller state and... Mm. You know, I think, you know, the fine wine game in Kansas, while it was there, it was kind of just trying to educate people on, you know, the world of fine wine. So mm-hmm. another great education for me up there, learning how to be, you know, a fine wine distributor within a smaller state. Mm-hmm. And then after three and a half years, four years, my wife was like, let's go home to Texas. And by this time we had two more sons. So we have three little boys and we are up there, just the two of us and her family's here, so Texas was we're like we're ready to come back. So she was from Dallas. Yeah, she was yeah she was uh, she's from Texas. Okay, um, so that's where I met her. Um, almost, yeah, ten year almost ten years ago now. Wow, congratulations! Yeah. That was great. That's... <laughs> yeah. So uh, so we were ready to come home, and I I mean as much as I learned and you know enjoyed, you know what I did in Kansas, I was true. I was ready to like you know come back to Texas and be be a Texan again. Mm-hmm. And so the opportunity uh, was available to go back to R&DC uh, and the role that I'm in now, which is basically a portfolio manager, but it is uh, 99.99% restaurants. And I only focus on the Texas portfolio, the Texas winery portfolio that we have. And while I'm an advocate and champion of all the wines that R&DC has, my focus is the Texas producers. And now I get to travel the state of Texas, you know, as far west as El Paso and Galveston and, and basically preaching the gospel of Texas wine. And How great is that? That's so it's an amazing role. I Did you create I, that role or was that something that they that No, didn't... so the role existed. Okay. Um, they tweaked it. Um, they wanted because RNDC has 15 different Texas wine producers. Mm-hmm. And so they felt and kudos to RNDC for re, for kind of re you know vamping the role. So I don't touch grocery, I don't touch retail uh, unless it's kind of like a fine wine shop. Mm-hmm. So they've you know we figured out that my role would be to go to restaurants across the state and just basically show the quality of Texas wine. And you know I've been very fortunate to taste a lot of great wines in my career through. You know, Texom and Pappas and just my career in general. And so basically I'm going to restaurant tours, sommeliers and saying, you know, these are great wines, not just, oh, this is a great wine for Texas. Like, True. No, no, no. like I've tasted some amazing wines in my career and I know what a great wine tastes like. And I can honestly go into these different sommeliers, restaurant tours, whomever and say, no, you need to try this wine because it's a great wine. You that, know, so yeah. I, but, since that, maybe first, maybe I, maybe that wasn't the case. What maybe two decades ago, maybe. Well, and again, it's a young industry. So if you think about it, Texas really started to come in its own late '60s, early '70s, mm-hmm. and I still like. I think over the course of you know the 40, 50 years that it's been on, they're they're still evolving. You know, again, if you look at you know Napa, you know technically, you know the first bonded winery, you know after Prohibition was Robert Mondavi in 1966. Mm-hmm. So. Again, That's but they were growing. young too, if you think of it. Yeah, that. exactly. Still, it's a, it's a, it's a. But Texas, I still think they were trying to figure out what grapes were right for the, the climate we are in. Because yeah, that's what I'd like to talk to too, because I'm sure that yeah. it's unique to Texas. Yeah, again, it's a, it's a unique climate. So I think while the quality was always there, I think for me, it's an exciting time to be a part 
of the industry and to be one of their voices because grape growers are talking to winemakers, winemakers are talking to grape growers, they're planting what works in certain pockets of the state, you know, so again, the quality is there. And so, you know, if, if I can get one Texas wine on every wine list in the state of Texas, I can sleep well at night. Oh, I've done... would, and how great would that be? That would be yeah, fantastic. You know, you know, because again, Texans are very prideful of things from Texas. Without you look it. at, you know, I stop at every Bucky's I can find on my, you know, on my travels. You know, you look at, you know, Tito's Vodka. You look at Garrison Brothers Whiskey. You look at Shine. Like, you look at Texas Spirits, mm -hmm. Texas Beer. It's a thing. So why not Texas wine? And I'm like, I, that's my question to them. Like, why not? Yeah. I'd have one. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not asking for a section. I'm not asking for a hundred. I'm asking for a white and a red on your list and show people that. Texas is truly capable of making some great wines. Yeah, and then as people, as their knowledge grows and they people start to understand that it does exist, that's when it could. You're getting a foothold, at least a baby step yeah. into. Yeah. Yeah, and again, I think you know we're still, you know, and again, people. I did a I did a wine dinner in New York. I flew to Manhattan and did a wine dinner at the uh, second oldest private club in Manhattan. Okay. And the biggest question that I got was, and, and the winery shipped in the wine, or the the, the club paid for the wines. Wineries shipped them in. And the biggest question I got from the people in New York was, why can't we get these wines in New York? You know, and my answer is because we're not there yet as far as, you know, national distribution. Mm -hmm. You know, Texans consume about 95 percent of what we produce here. OK. You know? So, you know, until we start planting, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres, you know, in the state, we're not going to have enough fruit to export out of the state. We're getting there slowly. And maybe we'll see that evolve in the next 10, 15, 20 years. But right now we're consuming the majority of what we're producing. How interesting is that? That's something too. Yeah. I guess, and I guess if you think of it, Texas is like its own country, essentially. It's I mean, and yeah, that's, you bring up a valid point because, again, I use this all the time. Texas as a landmass is larger than the country of France, you know? <laughs> so it's, at the end of the day, you know, people ask me all the time, what's the signature grape of Texas? And I'm like... There, I, I don't give one because, you know, if you look at, again, size-wise compared to France, how many different grape varietals are in France? How many different regions are in France? How many different climates? Why just, you know, pigeonhole yeah. ourselves as having two identifiable grapes where, you know, if you're in the high plains, certain things work well. If you're in the hill country, certain things work well. If you're in Escondido Valley, I mean, there's eight AVAs in the state of, uh, in the state of Texas. So okay. those who don't know uh, an AVA, American Viticultural Area. You know, so just like Napa Valley or Carneros, those are wine growing regions. Texas has eight of them and soon to be more. So, you know, I would say why limit ourselves to just a couple grapes? Are there certain varietals that don't work in this in Texas? Are there other ones that like I think just like or that maybe it will take some time to make sense? Or? There are certain grapes that thrive here. Um, warmer climate varietals, Spanish varietals, Southern Rhone varietals, you know, Tempranillo, Grenache, and so Morvedra are grapes that I think thrive here because. Again, it's it is a there's no climate, denying it. It's yeah. a warm climate. Mm -hmm. You know, you know it's ninety degrees, hundred degrees during harvest. You know, it, it can it can dip down to seventy at night, but still, you have that what we call the diurnal shift. Warm days wrapping up the fruit, cool nights to retain the acidity. People like to say that Pinot Noir or Chardonnay doesn't grow well here, and while maybe it's harder to grow here, I still think there are certain pockets that you can and plant those grapes. And they'll make good wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, would you want to plant, you know, Chardonnay in Galveston County? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be fooled. You'd be throwing away your money. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. If you can if you can find right along the New Mexico border, you know, which is a, is a wine growing region, mm -hmm. and you plant things that you know, like Chardonnay and, and you know, Pinot Noir, maybe you have a better chance of making some outstanding wine because again, you have that cooler climate. And again, it's all about the acidity and the balance, you know, of of finding that right. For the grape. Oh, that's, that's so so interesting. So, how did you get then to the connection to barbecue? How did was that something that you? I'm sure you've always been a yeah, lot of barbecue. So, I've always been a fan of barbecue. Yeah. Um, again, but this was kind of just going back to you know just a Weber Grill state. You know, just never truly what Texas barbecue was until I moved to Texas in '07, and then I had an idea of like we went to I think it was Papa's Barbecue and we're like okay this is wow okay this is a brisket this is what brisket tastes like mm -hmm. here. You know, so I was always enjoying it. And then for me, you know, barbecue is just another rabbit hole to go down. You know, just like, you know, learning about it, studying it, visiting it, just like wine. An obs uh, another obsession. Was, <laughs> exactly right. That's, that is a perfect term. It is an obsession. 
Um, if you ask anybody, like, if you look at my Instagram, it's my son's wine and barbecue. So it's like, there's not much <laughs> there you go. There. But I was doing a lot of commuting um, between Kansas and Texas, and I was listening to just a lot of podcasts because I had a lot of dashboard time. So mm. I was listening to different uh, barbecue podcasts, found one um, called Best Barbecue Show. A friend of mine, Yoni Levin, was hosting it. And I'm like, I'm listening to all these episodes, and I'm like, they should do a wine episode. So out of the blue, I just emailed uh, them and said, hey, if you're ever wanting to do a wine episode, let me know. I'll you know, figure it out how to get down there because I was still living in Kansas at the time. Was this a Yoni and Stover time? like that? that this was, yeah, this was still, yeah, prior when Stover was still there. Okay. Um, and then... So they reached back and said, let's do it. I love it. So this was probably, I probably emailed them in March or April. We set a date for June. And so uh, I contacted a bunch of the Texas producers I knew and said, hey, I'm going to be in Austin. I, can I, you know, can I talk about your wines? They sent me some sample bottles to use. And so uh, I drove down and it was Mark Black of Terry Black's Barbecue, mm-hmm. myself, Yoni. And this was the first episode since Stover had moved back to, I think, Oregon or Oregon. Oregon. Yeah, I think it was Oregon, yeah. Um, so it was just Mark, Yoni, and myself, and we paired up, I think it was nine different Texas wines with uh, Terry Black's Barbecue. Okay. And it was about an hour and ten minute episode, and you can tell, like, from the, from the time we started, I was a little nervous. By the time we finished, we were feeling really good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we was just a gauntlet of um, different AVAs. We did some McPherson, Becker. Um, Messina Hoff, we did um, Fall. We just it was a, it was a, a, a random. And, that, and again, this was I, the role that I'm in now wasn't even a thing yet. This oh, was really? like a, no, I was still working for the distributor in Kansas. Just again, me being obsessed with wine and barbecue, I was like, hey, let's do this episode. So I drove down, and then Mark took us to Terry Black's. We had a bunch of drinks, and you know he showed us around. And I'm like, all right, I'm hooked. So this was yeah, June June of 2018. I moved back to Texas in February of 19, and that's when this this role was available for being basically the Texas wine ambassador. And I interviewed for it, um, kind of showed them, you know, of all the Texas producers I already knew, and but you know, here's what I did with the podcast. And so I got the role and been running full, uh, you know, 90 miles an hour since. Oh, that's that's so great. So how yeah. so so how does I know that t- the Terry Blacks in Dallas carries mm-hmm. your wine. Right. So yeah, both both both, oh, both locations, locations do. So, okay, okay. I didn't know I didn't know if they had I didn't know if they had wine. I haven't yeah I haven't been in a long time to the Terry yeah, Black sauce. So okay. the funny thing was, so Mike Black, so Mark's brother, yeah. emailed me out of the blue, and I was still commuting, and I and I hadn't I had interviewed for the role, but I hadn't been uh, offered it yet. Mm-hmm. And he said, "Hey, we are looking to do some wine at Terry Black's. We're going to do kind of a grab and go. So basically, as you walk into their place, you know, you get in line for your food and your sides." they have a wine rack. So basically, you grab a bottle, you take it with you, they'll open it up, give you two Govino glasses, and you can have wine. So he said, would you help us, you know, basically get some, get get the wine program going? And again, I was laughing because I was like, I haven't even, I had interviewed, I hadn't gotten the role yet, so I couldn't say anything, but I'm like, I'll do it in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. So I helped them get their first wine program, and they were one of the first barbecue places that I think, again, I think there's some that were doing some wine, but they kind of went full bore, and kudos to them because they're killing it in Austin. And now they have basically they carbon copied what they're doing in Austin for Dallas just to get it started to see, you know, how it'll evolve. And you know, and again, because two different clientele, so Dallas may need some different, you know, different wines. And again, it's not just Texas wine; they have California, some Oregon, um, and, and obviously Texas. And Mike wants to get really into wine, right? I think they are both very into wine. I know. Uh, I almost think like he wants to someday open a vineyard. Like that's the way I feel. I think, I think that is. The, I think that's the plan. Um, I think they uh, at, the, at the end of the day they're gonna they're, they'll have yeah, whatever they're, they're, gonna call it, they're gonna have their own winery one of these days. I kind of feel I, like whatever they want to do, they can achieve. I feel like there. And again, I I have been very blessed, and I will say this, you know, to everybody who listens, and I'm like. Because of my connections through that initial, you know, podcast and just kind of what I'm doing now with the role, I have met so many great barbecue guys. You know, you know, obviously Mark and Mike, you know, Clay at Snows, Clay and Yoni did a barbecue and wine seminar for me at Austin Food and Wine Festival. So, yeah, and then uh, I think Mighty, I saw pictures of that because I remember yeah. seeing Clay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe Yin, you know, Joe, Mighty Joe Yin, 
Um, you know, so again, I've been very blessed to because again, to me, wine and barbecue are so similar in that it's it's a family. You know, it's basically it's a it's a passion, it's a love, and if, you know you you surround yourself by like minded people and. You know, you have uh, you have good friends around you, and the and the wine industry too. I've dabbled in it, and I've and I I'm a huge fan of wine. And people the, that world, there's a lot. It's a close close knit community as well. It's a community not exactly like barbecue, but there's a lot of people that are connected, intertwined in that world. It's a very incestuous world, I find. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Everybody knows everybody. Uh huh. And then so so why does wine pair so well with barbecue? Yeah. Well, and again. It, to, to each their own, because again, as a sommelier, um, you know, who am I to tell you what you should drink with your meal? You know, I'm there to assist a guest with finding that perfect pairing for that evening. You know, my favorite, I, I, you'll hear me talk about it a lot. You know, at Pappas, I would love when people would come in and say, you know, I'm having a dry aged ribeye, you know, with all of this, but I don't drink red wine. What are you going to pair for me? And I'd be like, that's for me is like. That's cool. I get to think outside the box and kind of come up. Challenge, yeah. So for me, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, for me, it's, you know, finding that perfect pairing. I think, you know, barbecue, there is, you know, just like a steak or just like you're at a steakhouse has lots of marbling, lots of fat. So you're going to find some things that, you know, with tannin. So you probably have the Tempranillo in your glass. Yeah, right yeah the Tempranillo was fantastic, too. Yeah. So, again, something with some tannin to it to kind of. You know, instead of attacking your gums, it's going to attack the protein of, of the barbecue. There's obviously some smoky flavors to it. And while, you know, you might get a little bit of that smoke, nutmeg, coriander characteristic from the oak, from the wine. Again, you know, it's it's all about finding that that perfect pairing. So I've got the, the Duke Minaglianico um, in my glass right now. And, uh, again, uh, an Italian varietal that thrives very well in Texas. So, again... You know, but again, what barbecue are you eating? You know, because my, you know, my wife and sons love smoked turkey. That's their thing. So maybe I can get, you know, a, a Marsan or a Roussan or Viognier to pair with that. That's true. Uh, okay. White wood, and, yeah. Yeah, it's all about our experimentation. That's the beautiful thing about, you know, wine is just finding, you know, what works best for that particular course. And, you know, I, and again, I'm, I'm totally fine with beer and Big Red and, you know, Dr. Pepper paired up with barbecue. But I think, you know... Just thinking outside that box and, and getting something new to try, you know, kind of, you know, is, is always fun. Yeah, and when, and when you pair something, whatever it is, with barbecue or whatever you're eating, it does elevate the experience and it changes the way you're enjoying that specific food. So sure. why not try wine yeah. with that, I think? You know, again, you know, and, and again, kind of talk about Terry Box, kudos to them because they give, they're giving their guests the opportunity to – have that choice to have wine with their barbecue. And I think you know, while most places, I think eventually will, and I hope that's the case, yeah. you know, um, you know, but just, you know, like I said, I got nothing against the old guard of beer and, and, and other beverages, but again, trying to just elevate the overall dining experience. And, you know, people think, Oh, barbecue is so casual and it's wine is so snobbish. I'm like, no, it's not. Really, I mean, actually, it really isn't. You can drink, and there's a. Um, I went to with some friends to a new place in Arlington called Hurtado Barbecue. Hurtado, and, uh, Hurtado or yeah, Hurtado, yeah, yeah. We went there. I went there with some friends, and uh, it was good. And uh, we, my friend bought a, brought a bottle of wine, and we drank it out of uh, red Solo cups. I mean, again, it's not. You, know, you can get as fancy as you want and get fancy glasses, but at the end of the day, it's a it's fermented grape juice. It's a beverage. Mm -hmm. So as long as it's adding to that overall enjoyment of your food, and wine, and friends, because that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about being surrounding yourself with you know friends and family and great wine and great food. And I also do feel like it wine makes you feel different than when you drink beer. Like it does, like what it does to you, like the way that you feel. I hate to say like the buzz, but it's yeah. just the kind of the. I think it's a there's a mellow feeling that you sometimes get that, that yeah. and then an openness uh, and maybe the conversation because I, sometimes beer is heavy. There's certain beers are heavy. Sometimes makes it feel heavier, whereas wine at times makes it feel smoother. With I. I found with certain pairings, and I, and, 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 and I can I can totally agree with that because again, I mean, you think about the, the components of wine. You got tannin, you got acid, you got alcohol. I mean, there's all there's, it's it's going to change, you know, what you're eating. If, I'm, if we're just drinking the wine like we are right now without any food in front of us, it's going to taste one way. Mm -hmm. But if we throw you know some fatty and lean brisket and a pork rib in front of us, mm -hmm. it's going to change the food, and the wine's going to change for sure. You know, so again, to me, it's all about you know, it's not snobbish. It's not you know. 
you know, putting the wine on a pedestal, which we do, because, you know, if you go to, you know, a small Italian village, they're going to give you wine and a little, you know, a little goblet. And, and you're, it's all about just pairing and having it part of their food, not just, you know, fancy glasses and decanters, which, again, I'm, I'm totally fine with. Mm. And also, but, too, we're, we're, it's, we're, it's a younger, we're a younger country. We, it's not as, as commonplace for, like, there's even kids drinking wine in certain countries where they'll have a little bit with dinner. It's something that this is a normal yeah, occurrence. You know, yeah, they'll take wine, they'll cut it with water, you know, but, you know, we, you know, I think prohibition, again, not, not to get all history on you, but like, <laughs> no, but it's true. Kind of, you know, for those 13 years, kind of put a damper on our consumption of wine mm-hmm. and alcohol in general. You know, so then we, you know, we're, we're, we're playing catch up with all the other countries that are been drinking wine for hundreds, thousands of years. You know, and we are a sweeter country. We enjoy sweeter beverages, Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, you know, things that, that is have true. That's true. Them. You know, so if, if I give someone who's never had dry wine before and I give them the red wine we're drinking right now, they're going to go, mm-hmm. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But. If I can get them a white Zinfandel, mm-hmm. which has got some sugar into it, and then I can get them into a you know a Moscato, which has got some sugar to it, then a Riesling, then I can go into a Chardonnay, and a Chardonnay to a Pinot Noir, Pinot, you know, mm-hmm. it's that gateway drug, you know, you get them hooked <laughs> up with something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's you opening know, up their palate, or it's expanding their yeah, palate. Yeah, yeah. You know, and again, I I was paid off commission as a as a sommelier, so at the end of the day. As long as they're not drinking beer and or spirits and they're drinking wine, I don't care what they're drinking as long as they're drinking wine. Exactly. Well, let's talk about, at least let's talk about, first off, the Fall yeah. Creek that I'm, that I'm drinking. I know you're not drinking <laughs> that one, right? It's the, uh, and it's Salt, Lo- Salt Lake Vineyard. So, yes. so there's, a reason I, there's a reason I sent you that one. Yes, definitely. Uh, so have you been to Salt Lake Barbecue before? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to this have been. And that, a lot of, for yeah. a lot of people, it's the first place they've ever gone to. Correct. And it's a very photogenic. There's obviously got the open pit there. It's been around for, I don't know, 50, 50 something, 40 years. Yeah. Scott, who I've met a couple times, great guy. Um, awesome He's in the wine too. <laughs> obviously. That's so, so to me as a Somali, a sense of place is very important. For sure. So I can go to a restaurateur, a Somali, or any guest and say, hey, have you been to Napa before? And they say yes. And I say, okay, cool. When you're driving up north on, you know, 29 and you hit Oakville, you look to the left, you see Mandavi Vineyard you know that's where Tokalone Vineyard is, and it's a very famous vineyard in Napa Valley. So I can go to the guests and or sommeliers or whomever I'm talking to and say, have you been to Salt Lake before in Driftwood? Uh-huh. And they say yes. And I say, cool, you know the vineyard's in the parking lot? And they say yes. I said, that's this fruit. Perfect. So to me, it gives them a sense of like, oh, I've been there, I've seen it, and it's a, an idea of what that wine is. Yeah, it's, it's creating a story and like a, exactly. it's, it's visceral. It's, it's, yeah. So Fall Creek um, has two properties. I have one in Driftwood, which is their tasting room, um, which is right across the street from Salt Lake Barbecue. And they have one in Tao, Texas, which is uh, about an hour and a half north uh, there on the outskirts of Hill Country. And that's where they're uh, making all the wines up there. Okay. Um, so they, they have uh, some amazing wines. They do Chardonnay. They do Tempranillo. They do uh, GSM, so Grenache, Syrah, Morvedra. Uh, but why I wanted to uh, show you that one is because Tempranillo – is one of those grapes here in Texas where they go, okay, this is, you know, this is a signature grape of Texas. And while I think it does extremely well in Texas, I don't want to, you know, just like pigeonhole. Pigeon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it, it thrives. So this is actually one of the eight ABAs of Texas. So if you look right. at the label, it says Texas Hill Country on their Salt Lake Vineyard. And so that's so one 2017. of 2017. Yeah. And so what people don't know about Texas wine, or I shouldn't say they don't know, but they think that, you know, Fredericksburg is the kind of the epicenter of all things Texas wine. And while it is for B&Bs and, and travel and tourism and lots of wineries, 75% of the grapes that are used to make Texas wine come from the High Plains, which is near Lubbock. Okay. So for me, Interesting. Like, yeah. So again, so 75, three quarters of the grapes that make Texas wine come from up north. This is one that I love to show because, again, it has that hill country appellated. Mm-hmm. And I should say that that is very important to me. So when I'm showing a wine, it has it has the Texas Appalachian on there, which encompasses any vineyards from the state. Mm-hmm. Hill Country, which means it came from that Appalachian. High plain, you know. Again, truly, you know, the fact that the wines, the grapes are grown in Texas, produced here. That's the type of stuff that I want to show. And this is a very drinkable wine. It's it's yes. not not only is it would it be great paired with something, 
but it's an everyday table one. Yeah, I, I think it's a great. It's a, it goes down smooth, and it's and it's got that. It also, I, I, do I do I taste like leather? I, almost not leather, but like it's yeah, that. Sandal, yeah, it's kind of got a little bit of that terroir. They use uh, some newer French oak on it. Uh, oh. The wine, maker, the winemaker there is a guy named Sergio, uh, Sergio Quadra. He was making wine in Chile and Argentina, and on a recommendation from a guy named Paul Hobbs, he oh, moved his Hobbs. Family, <laughs> yeah. So he moved his family up to uh, up to Texas and has been making wine at Fall Creek. I think seven vintages now. Okay. And so some killer stuff, but you know, I, I love to show that wine, um, and not necessarily just to barbecue guys, but it gives an idea of a sense of place. And they're like, oh, I've, yeah, of course, I've been to Salt Lake. I know that place, and I'm like. The vineyards in the parking yeah, that's lot. That's nice. No, it's. I think it's important. It contextualizes yeah. it. Yeah. So, the, well, I love to show McPherson too because um, you can't talk about Texas wine without talking about Kim McPherson, who is the winemaker and owner of this winery. Mm. You can't talk about it without mentioning his dad. Okay. So in the late '60s, early '70s. Oh, that's nice. Doc McPherson, um, along with a, a gentleman named Bob Reed, planted some experimental vines uh, in the High Plains near Lubbock. Okay. And without those two gentlemen, there would not be, in my opinion, or I think many people's opinion, a Texas wine industry. Okay. So Kim um, is his son and uh, opened up uh, his own winery in 2000 in the old Coca-Cola bottling factory in downtown Lubbock. Oh, that's great. Uh, an outstanding winemaker, grooming the next generation of Texas winemakers, you know, kind of being a mentor to them, uh, but makes some amazing wines. He uh, So since so, uh, why I love to show that mm-hmm. is because... Cinso is a Southern Rhone varietal, so uh, used in, in Cote de Rhone, Chateauneuf de Pop, grows well in Texas. Um, but to me, if you are tasting it right now, someone who enjoys Pinot Noir will enjoy this wine. It's a little bit of a lighter body style of wine. So think about if we're talking about barbecue, maybe a pork steak, mm-hmm. Snow's pork steak, something <laughs> you know, which I love. Um, uh, you know, a pork rib. Um, so something a little bit of lighter fare. So while the Tempranillo. Maybe good for fatty brisket, a beef rib. Um, you could pair the Cinso with, you know, black pepper sausage. And again, there's so many different things. I mean, again, it's barbecue yeah, and pork, wine. pork, all, all the all the pork, all, all the pork all day long. <laughs> all day long, you know. And again, you know, I, and again, it's who am I to tell anybody what to drink? I just, I can give advice and guidance on what to to enjoy. Um, but two hundred twenty four cases. That's not a lot. That's yeah. And he's and he puts every single. Um, case production on each label and again i love when it's a somali or somebody will go to me like oh you know i, I want to show more esoteric things <laughs> from unknown regions on my wine list i'm like i brought you a Cinso from the high plains of texas that has 224 cases like that's about i, I was that guy like don't bs a bser like you know i know you know it's it's about you know just trying different things that would be small batch if you were it's very small production <laughs> Yes, that is a small production, it, and he makes quite a few different wines. And I and I put a couple more, just like I don't know if you can see them in the back. I just yeah, I can, I I can. Can. yeah. So he there's a EVS Windblown, okay. um, and again, uh, R and D C has 15 Texas wineries. So some of the big ones, Yano Estacado, up in the High Plains, okay. uh, McPherson up there, Rancho Loma Vineyards. And for and if you're listening to this on the podcast, I would recommend jumping to the YouTube version of it so you can see what we're yeah. we're talking yeah. about. So Rancho Loma Vineyard, that is their uh, number three bottling, or the three, that's a blend of Viognier, Marsan, Roussan. Uh, but some of the other ones, we have um, Messina Hoff is one of RNDC's uh, producers, okay. very well-known uh, winery. They have quite a few different uh, wineries, one in College Station near Texas A&M. Oh, wow. They have one in Grapevine, Texas. They have one in Fredericksburg, and they're opening one in Houston. Uh, Becker Vineyards uh, is another one we represent. Okay. Big name in Fredericksburg, lots of different uh, wines that they produce. And I've heard of them before, yeah. Yeah, they make some amazing wines. Um, Fall Creek, so Yano, the 1836, um, and then uh, Brennan Vineyard. So Brennan Vineyards is an interesting one because it's located in Comanche, Texas. Where's that? So so if you're in Fort Worth, <laughs> okay. you drive on 20 West until you hit the Strong exit, which is the 16 exit, and you can make a right to go to Mary's Cafe for their famous chicken fried steak. Or you can make a left and drive another hour to Comanche, Texas, okay. and which is where Brennan is at. And in my opinion, Brennan will be, or say Comanche, Texas, will be the ninth AVA in the state of Texas. Um, they, you know, they, they filed the paperwork, and they use Texas 
on their label because while a lot of the fruit comes from Comanche, until it's a designated AVA, they can't put that on their label. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. So once that is an AVA, they will be able to put Comanche Texas on there. So um, Hack Vineyards. We have down uh, in Galveston. Oh, yeah. Dukeman, uh, essentially the Aguianico. So Dukeman is located in Driftwood, Texas. Um, awesome owner, Dr. Stan Dukeman, based in Houston. Him and his wife, Lisa, traveled to Italy um, and fell in love with Italian wines and opened up a property in Driftwood. And Dave Riley makes some killer wines. Um, Vermentino, Aglianico, some grapes that you may not, you know, see on a regular basis. Yeah, Aglianico, I've never heard of. What is it similar to? It is similar. So it's grown um, grown in the Campania region of Italy, so right along the coast. Um, if you want to compare it to anything stylistically, maybe a Sangiovese. Okay. Uh, some kind of that, you know, that bright red fruits, Bing cherries, wild strawberries. So do people use this as a blend? Do they usually blend it with other ones or – um, it depends on, so for him, no, for it's him, it's straight, a, like a hundred percent, right? Straight Aglianico. Yeah. Um, I have, no, it's an Aglianico. Um, they do a Vermentino, um, which is a white, high acid white wine grown on the island of Sardinia. <laughs> so, again, so like Texas is like, it's a thing, like just to kind of show you what people are doing here. It's a thing. Like, yeah. You, it's, it's definitely a thing. And it's also, it's complex. Absolutely. There's, you know, it's like, it's not just, again, Cabernet, you know, I think people identify with Cabernet, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir because they've heard of those grapes. They, they know what those are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, your Shiraz or Syrah. But at the end of the day, you know, I think you have to grow what works well in, in your region. And again, it's, it's it's planting what works right. And and I'll I'll bring I'll bring the Becker Cabernet. I'll bring the Messina Hoff Cabernet front because I. Well, I want to show Aglianico and Vermentino and some obscure grapes because that's the the psalm in me to to say, okay, I love esoteric stuff. You got to have things that people can identify with because, again, it's also a business. So if you're a restaurateur and owner and I bring you a bunch of 10 different obscure grapes that nobody's ever heard of, you're not going to sell them. They're going yeah, to sit people there. tend to want Cabernets with yes, steaks. You know, or, you know. and, that kinda, and, that, and that brings me to like where – you know, we, you know, I love when people say, well, this doesn't taste like my Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. And I'm like, cool, it shouldn't. It shouldn't, no, it shouldn't, no. It's from, you know, it's from the high plains of Texas or it's from the hill country. You know, we, and I know why we do it, we like to compare apples to apples, mm -hmm. you know, because we want to say, oh, this, I want this to remind me of what I know and I love and understand. But you have to start appreciating things for what they truly are and where they're grown, not just for what you no, true, and what we've tasted in the past. So now, where do people? If people listen to this and they're, I'm going to in the show notes and a companion blog piece. I'm going to put information as to all the vineyards and all the all the all the producers. Are you sure. going like where? If can they find these at most restaurants, or is that like, or can they ask for these, and or how, or where are they going to? And then, are there tasting rooms at most of these places? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. You, so every winery uh, will have a tasting room. You okay. just have to go to that location where they're at, and again. There are – the mecca of far as tasting room is concerned is in the Hill Country in, in Fredericksburg. Um, you know, if you happen to find yourself going to Evie Mays in, uh, in Lubbock, What's you know, you can, go to, you can go to Yano Sicado, you can go to McPherson. You can just and – you, and you can search them out. And, uh, and some uh, of them require re reservations, I'd assume, right? You can, you can walk in. Okay, okay. If, yeah. If you, want, if, you, if you want a private tasting, you can give them my email and I can set up a private <laughs> tasting for them. But, gotcha, yeah, most okay. of them you can walk in and just uh, okay. and taste – but yeah, so and again, another great resource is a Texas Wine and Grape Growers Association website, which I can send you that link to okay, it. Perfect. Because it gives you just a kind of a, a 10,000 foot view of Texas wine. Mm -hmm. um, because again, I know I've seen people have this idea of what Texas wine is in their brains. And maybe they've tasted one 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And they go, oh, Texas. And I'm like, no, 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 Texas. Like, try it now. Try mm -hmm. it these, these wines. Um, and, and again, it's, it's about changing, you know, people's opinions, one, whether they're good, bad or indifferent, like just giving them an opportunity to taste, you know, these wines. And what I've tried these two right now, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't even like, if you told me where they were from, I wouldn't, I would just know they're good wine. I, 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 they're enjoyable. They're wonderful wines. If I blind tasted you on them, if mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, if I just poured them in a glass, you'd say, wow, these are great wines. Mm -hmm. You, know, and and so, you might yes, even guess California or you might guess yeah, from, yeah. You never know. And so for your listeners, like, yeah, you can, you know, I always say when you walk into your favorite restaurant, if they have a Texas wine, great, support it, order it. If they don't, ask the question to 
the manager, the wine bar, whomever is there say, why not? Mm -hmm. Why not one? You know, what do you, you know, what do you have not against Texas wine, but why not at least have one on there for us to support? Because again, Texans being very prideful of things from Texas, you know, the Texas wine should be part of that camp. And then could people order these online somewhere? Is there somewhere that yeah. you, should be, you should be able to go to their websites and find them uh, online? Um, certain wines you can find in your HEBs, your specs, your your your, your wine yeah. shops in the country. You may not find all of them uh, in the retail because I love to have certain things that are just meant for restaurants as well. Kind of giving that exclusivity of getting them taste yeah. the restaurants and then go go find them in the grocery. Are there any other barbecue spots other than? Blacks, Terry Blacks, that has. Um, yeah, I think Ronnie Killian's doing some wine. At his place. He's got a, yeah, he's got a steakhouse. He's got some barbecue places. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I know those three for sure. Okay. I'm sh- no, it, it, it'll grow, and a lot of places don't yeah. have but maybe now, the capacity it, it, to be able to. Yeah, and now we're looking at different aspects of barbecue because if you go to Loro, which technically is you know yeah. barbecue, they have a wine program, they have a spirits program. Um, if you go to um, Dai Dewey, which is in Austin, which is, I guess, technically not barbecue, but it is live fire cooking. Oh, yeah. You know, so then we get in the whole topic of, you know, live fire versus offsets and stuff. But there's a lot of, you know, great restaurants that have live fire cooking and or just true classic Central Texas style barbecue that are now doing wine. And as we do these interviews, as the years go by we'll start to see other places that we'll have. And we'll talk about those as they pop up because I think that would be interesting for people. I I wanted to ask you, and I had had mentioned in an email, there are, when when people go to a restaurant and they want to order wine, a lot of people are intimidated, and especially maybe if they haven't ever had wine. What's, are there like three things as a sommelier that people can, like, are there tricks that people are trying to pull on, like restaurants are trying to pull on people? Is there like three tips, three tips for people? Not, yeah. tri- I don't say tricks, but then sometimes people feel like they're, like they're being upsold or something. That's sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. So yes, first of all, like I, t- I said earlier before, like let us as a sommelier be your guide, not steer you towards something that we want to drink tonight that you should have. Like, again, it's about enhancing. If you, if you don't like San Giovese and you're dead set against it and I think it's the perfect pairing, then I failed at my job because I'm not getting the guest what they truly want. So, you know, if, if, it's a, if it's a couple having dinner, you know, just to get away from the kids for a night, like, that's an important night out because you don't get to do that often. So why have someone force you into something you don't want? So, again, I always say ask the questions, you know, give the Somalia, you know, some tips and Uh, Say, hey, we normally like to enjoy X, but tonight we want to try something a little bit different. What would you recommend? And the sommelier should never come out and say, what's your budget or what's your price? But is that something, though, that someone – can you feel comfortable telling a sommelier that? Like is that – Yeah, we have have three little boys, and if my wife and I get to go out, and we don't have a $1,000 wine budget. We maybe have a $100 wine budget if if, if it's a nice occasion. So if I'm looking for a $40 – bottle of white and a $60 bottle of red, I can say, here's our budget for the night. We want to do two bottles. Here's our budget. And yeah, I mean, okay, okay. no one should ever poo poo your evening out. You are there. Like they have a job because you are there enjoying your overall dynamics, mm-hmm. you know, but again, kind of, you know, not comparing apples to apples, but if you say, I love Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, but I've been reading about France. Do you have something that we might like from region this? That's you a know? good, that's a good tip. Yeah, again, it's it's about giving the sommelier the information to help you make a choice that you want. You know, and again, if, if they if the sommelier brings out something that you totally hate, like, okay, I mean, it happens, you know, and again, it's it, it, each restaurant is, you know, different, you know, but again, hopefully, you know, you can tell them, hey, I'm having, you know, a ribeye or I'm having, you know, sushi tonight. What do you recommend to go with each? Definitely. And then what about at a wine shop? What's other... Any tips or tricks for going to a wine shop? Same, same principles. Ask the question. Mm-hmm. And just ask the, you know, hopefully they all, each place will have some kind of person, not dedicated to wine, but has some kind of knowledge. And just say, hey, I normally like to drink this. You know, do you have something in this price point from this region that would be something different for us? Or, you know, sometimes I'll go and say dealer's choice. Dealer's choice tonight. Here's my budget. You know, I want to get it. I want to I try something different tonight. Yeah, because you can, you can fall in love with something. Exactly. You can find something new. And again, you know, and I think, 
you know, information is always power, you know, as, as much as I listen to barbecue podcasts and read books and stuff like that. Again, tr- trying to find something I haven't had before makes it more enjoyable to me. It's exciting. I, I think yeah. it's a... something different. Yeah. And then is, is there any, any other tips? Like, so if someone was starting to get into Texas wine do you, and, mm-hmm. and they want to reach out to you, is that, do you mind a DM Please. from them? I don't or, okay. shoot okay. email on there. You can, they can shoot me in any, I will answer at any time. Um, because again, I love being one of the voices of these producers because I truly feel that they deserve the, the respect, you know, as other wine regions and other producers have, you know, have earned, they do as well. So I want to make sure that, you know, I'm, and again, while I, while I represent 15 different Texas producers, or there's a, there's a gauntlet of, of producers out there. So I would like to feel like I'm a champion for all Texas wine, you know? So if I go into a restaurant and I see five different Texas wines from five producers I don't represent, Awesome, they're doing a great job. You deserve credit for having Texas wine on your wine list. By the way, have you tried any of mine? <laughs> of course, yeah, definitely. <laughs> always, always about that. So, Jason, is there anything that we've missed? Anything in, that you want to get across to people when it comes to what you do and what your company does? Well, and again, I mean, I, and I, I'm very blessed to work for you know a very large you know nationwide company that believes in in, in representing all producers. And again, I'm very fortunate to be in this role that I am. You know, I, I like to make the joke since March 1st, I now have 44,000 miles on my car <laughs> traveling in the great state of Texas, visiting all these producers, restaurant tours. And again, I always leave every dinner, every seminar with, you know, with this is if you go into a restaurant in Texas or, you know, wherever you're listening, say, do you have a Texas wine on your wine list? Cool. If you do, if not, why not? Definitely. You know, why not one? Why not two? Support local. We like to say eat local, drink local, you know, farm to table this. But we're missing out on the Texas wineries um, because, again, I think there's this idea in certain people's minds of what it is. But it's my job. And, again, I'm one voice. There's many voices out there of being an advocate for Texas wine, of showing the quality of these wines. Definitely. Now, it, is, it, is there a sparkling wine from Texas? Is there is. So there's, uh, there's McPherson sparkling wine, which is a sparkling Chenin Blanc. Okay. Uh, Gr- Great Creek is making one now. Um, so there's a handful of them out there. Flat Creek makes one. Um, so I was just thinking for special occasions for people. They love to get sparkling, and then they, you know, they, who yeah, knows where they get. Yeah, Messina Hoff makes one, so you can definitely, you can definitely seek them out. Okay. I just, yeah, it just popped into my head, so I was wondering. Yeah. yeah. But, right. but Jason, thank you so much for taking the time, and, and I'm sure after this is over, I'll have a thousand questions, so yeah. we'll do a part two and part seven. Okay. I love uh, it, and thank you for having me and being, uh, and, and being able to opportunity to talk about you know, wine, wine and barbecue. Yeah, definitely. When I come to Dallas, we'll get together, we'll get some wine, we'll film, talk, and do all that good stuff. But uh, I do appreciate that. Have a great rest of your uh, holiday season. Happy New Year. Thank you. Appreciate and, it to you. Excellent. Thank you.